Greet one another, so go ahead and stand up and maybe give a COVID-friendly air hug or a shake, I mean, an air shake or a wave. <laughs> well, good morning and welcome to Calvary Street. It's been a busy morning around here, all kinds of fun technical difficulties. So if you're online, we apologize for getting those worked out. And uh, we're just glad to have the opportunity to, to get together and serve the Lord. And uh, today we have a great opportunity to see... Uh, why we made the great choice to choose Christ, because we're going to talk about hell. And you get to hear about all the reasons why you don't want to go there. And if you've not made that decision today, it would be a great opportunity to make a decision for Christ so that you don't end up what we're going to talk about today. Uh, today, if you want to give your donations or a prayer request to the white boxes back there on the table, go ahead and do that and stick around after church. There's a few donuts and so forth. And I'm going to pray for the offering. Oh, and also, again, men's on Tuesdays, prayer on Wednesday night on Zoom, and the login information can be obtained through Pastor Jason. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness, and we thank you for your Holy Spirit, and we are grateful that uh, the place of hell, we don't have to go there, that you've given us an out through the death and resurrection on the cross, and we're thankful that we've chosen to follow you. We've chosen to accept that uh, redemption so that we don't have to go there. Uh, we ask your blessing upon the offering and the remainder of the service. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Good afternoon. Good to have everybody with us. Um, I'm going to call Gil up in just a minute here, but just a quick intro. Also, something to pray for. Um, as we're starting to hear, more and more things are opening. Um, hopefully, schools will be opening. Uh, keep that in prayer uh, as far as where the Lord uh, would put us, what doors he would open. It'd be great to get back on to Sunday mornings. We very much appreciate the door that God opened here, but this seems definitely like a temporary spot until the Lord moves us to our next location. So keep that in prayer where that might be. Um, and as you guys know as well, or let you guys know as well, that while we're staying in this position of renting, and something else we're doing is saving to see if when the time comes, the Lord would open a door for us to be able to lease something. That way we could have services throughout the week. That's our, our in, an end goal is to get into something where we could have more activity, services, outreach, places to invite people um, in the long run. And so even getting back to the school or something like that would be short term in, in the long run of the, the life of the church until we're able to get our own building and find something. So if you could keep that in prayer with us, we're always looking. Almost every day I look and see if the Lord might open that door to lease or rent something, and it just hasn't happened. I, we, we've even looked in surrounding cities and communities. We just want to be open to wherever it is the Lord wants us to be, to reach that community. Again, that's where, he, where he's going to plan us to reach those people in that area. Where is that? And so right now it's here. We want to be thankful and utilize it, um, and then see if the doors open soon for something else. And with that, um, uh, last week we called it kind of Outreach Saturday. We're going to try and maybe do something like that once a month, um, at least, to where we reach out to the community around us. And so last Saturday we, we took, um, a few of us went, some of us went to, we all went down to where our old school was, where we were meeting. We went where the H Mart is, there's a Starbucks there, and so a couple people walked around the parking lot just seeking who they could pray for. We have new flyers for the church they were handing out to people. And then uh, a while ago, there was an idea during Christmas time, like when we were doing the uh, caroling, when we went out caroling, uh, my wife had a good idea. I was like, why don't we go to like a place like a Chick-fil-A or somewhere where there's cars lined up and we have a, a captured audience, right? There, I think we got the idea when we drove by Raising Cane's. Um, we saw this long line and my wife's like, man, what a great audience. We could sit there and do uh, worship and sing um, Christmas carols. And then if they're asking, what are you guys doing out here? We could hand them flyers and literature uh, and so uh, see how that goes. And I thought, you know, it would even be really cool is if we got gift cards for wherever we are, little $5 things. And, and that would give us that touch point where we could walk up and say, hey, you want a $5 gift card to this place? You're going there anyway. You know, let us buy you a burger or whatever. And so last week um, that came to fruition, we went to Starbucks. I bought like 20 gift cards. 
And, but it was funny because on the way there, um, I woke up that morning, I'm like, what a dumb idea, right? And on the way driving there, I'm like, this is dumb. Like, who's going to, who, how are we going to walk up to people? They're not going to roll their windows down. Uh, a few of the people that were excited about it weren't able to come for various reasons. I'm like, and, and you know, I should, you know, we'll do it next month. They'll have the opportunity. And all of a sudden, th these ideas hit. And so I'm driving this way, and I'm just talking to the Lord, going like, Lord, what do you want us to do? You know, should we just go hand out flyers, pray for people? Do you want us to go to Starbucks and do this gift card idea? And this thought hit me of like, man, there's never a dumb idea when your intention is to share the gospel. If, if you look like a fool, who cares? I mean, if your intention is, hey, let's just use every avenue to share Jesus with people. So I was like, okay, let's just do it. And if I look dumb, who cares? You know, if people throw their coffee at me or whatever. Um, and so we went and Gil and I actually did the Starbucks deal. Uh, Aristelli and Miguel walked the parking lot and prayed and shared with people, uh, and that was really cool. But I thought I'd ask Gil to come up because we, we noticed a few things when we were doing that. And so Gil's going to come up and just share a little bit about what he experienced uh, with that. So come on, Gil. All right. Hey, hi. good afternoon. I got quiet on crickets. Good afternoon, guys. All right. So uh, what Pastor Jason pretty much introduced was pretty much what I was going to introduce, so he did half of that for me, but uh, there was a few things that I did. I had to write them down just to kind of make sure that I covered some of the bases. Uh, but when, we, when, we're, when I was driving in, I was even thinking, okay, Lord, there's been opportunities for me to share the gospel at work and everywhere else, my neighbors. This is a little different because we're talking initial cold call connections with people that are very, very, you don't know where they're at, okay? So my first initial response or, or even uh, thought was probably, well, there's going to be a lot of fear out there. People are going to be uncomfortable. They're not going to want to talk. The whole, you know, six-foot social distancing, yada, 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 right? Plus, they probably thought if myself or Pastor Jason or Miguel or Adeseli, who was with us, went out there and, and said, hey, man, you know, try to approach them, that we're trying to sell them like a timeshare or something like that. So there's, there's a lot of people that are really, oh, I don't know, man. But the reality was as soon as I started using Pastor Jason's method of, hey, no strings attached, you know, just to kind of throw that out there as a line, um, people were more receptive. And instead of being fearful uh, and, you know, standoffish, I, I thought I, I started receiving more of an appreciation. People were more open, even rolled down their windows and, like, were willing to listen to what we had to say. So, you know, we gave them a $5 Starbucks card and compliment, you know, compliments from uh, Calvary Cerritos, and we gave them a flyer to invite them to church. We also encouraged them if they do have some sort of prayer request and they can't come in, you could also email your prayer request. We'll lift it up as a body of Christ. But our whole deal was just to reach out and make that initial contact. So uh, for me, doing cold calls back in the day, the early 20s, selling commercial vehicles, it kind of took me back to that place, but I was comfortable. And I was like, all right, Lord, I could see how you prepared me for a time like this, for your glory. So I was, there was a lot of reflection that I was able to make on the way over to help Eric out. I spent some time with Eric after too, which was pretty cool. But um, it, was a, it was a great idea, I thought. I thought it was a little like, oh man, this is kind of far-fetched, especially this time, of, this time of year, this time that we're living in. But it was cool in a sense where we're able to see how people are really out there. And I think because everybody's trapped in their homes, more or less, I think there's that need and that desire to even make connections with people that are strangers. So I saw that people were open. I, I, I did see an opportunity to reach the loss, especially in this community that God had plan us, has planned us in. So uh, I'll just encourage you guys, if you know, take it before the Lord, ask him if this is something that he wants you to do and, and get a little uncomfortable for the Lord. Get a little uncomfortable out there. It's not comfortable, but the more you do it, the more easier it gets. Um, and we're to die to self anyway. So hearing no shouldn't take us, you know, shouldn't take us to a place we don't want to be. They're not saying no to us. You know, they're, they're technically saying no to, to the truth. So uh, we could do it with love. And, and what I did notice was there was, and I'll, I'll make it short, but what I did notice was at a couple of times when, the, you know, a couple of people are walking by saying, no, man, I'm good. I'm looking at them like, dude, and I was going to use an adjective from Proverbs, you know, <laughs> fool, right? Like, dude, this is, you fool, this is free, you know? But it opened up opportunities for us to actually save those cards and reach those that got strategically put there for us to actually hand out uh, some flyers to and a gift card. And people were blessed. I was blessed. Uh, and it was a great opportunity. I'm even thinking about taking my son and my daughter to go out there so they could just see it. They could be a part of it. And then when they're ready to do it, hand them some gift cards or hand them some flyers and have them go out there and make some of those 
uh, outreaches, reaching, reaching the lost and so forth, being used by God. So anyhow, it was a blessing. Uh, I just encourage you guys, and that'll, that'll be about it. But I, I think Adeseli and Miguel also had a, a great experience, so you can pretty much touch base with them after too. So, All right, so God bless. Thanks. Yeah, it's kind of interesting just approaching people. Everybody's first reaction is it kind of, they all kind of like lean back a little bit and put their head down like, okay, like what are you selling? And that's why I was like, no, no, it's just free. We just want to treat you to a cup of coffee. We're the local church here. And then it's almost like their face changed immediately. Like, really? And so um, interesting because same thing with caroling. Before we went caroling, I'm like, I, I don't like to sing right? Uh, this is lame. I don't like to carol, period. And now it's COVID. People are, I'm, I, I was really expecting when we went there for people to yell at us because of COVID. Like, what are you doing? Because they yelled at our men's study, our men's breakfast when we were at the park. People pulled up, stopped, and yelled at us, put your mask on. So I'm, ex- I'm expecting people to throw things at us while we're caroling. I'm like, all right, this is for you, Jesus, right? Um, but hey, every, people were in tears when we were caroling. A couple people got emotional. We got to pray for a lady who recently lost her husband. And so this shouldn't be confined to like, okay, hey, we're going to share our faith one day a month. This is mainly a primer. It's like, let's, let's kind of get out, get used to sharing it. So hopefully it's contagious to where then the rest of our life, hey, I want to do more of that. I want to look for more opportunities to share with people. Uh, and it kind of uh, spreads from there. But again, we'll plan something next month. And uh, for my personality type, I know Robbie has shared that as well. Um, I'm not a real extrovert. He, both of us are typically more introverts and um, you're more one-on-one conversion, conversate type people. Um, and so doing things like that doesn't come naturally. It feels very awkward. Um, but it's like, okay, it's, that's healthy sometimes, you know, to get out of your comfort zone. And again, it, who, who's, who do you think it was telling me on Saturday, what a dumb idea? Do you, you think that was Jesus saying, what a dumb idea, sharing the gospel with people? That was the enemy, right? Trying to feed that. Because for a whole month, I thought, what a great idea. What a cool idea. I prayed about it. Man, that's, that's going to work. And then that morning, what a dumb idea that is, right? And so that was definitely the enemy and, and important to discern his voice. So we thought, too, we, I had a cool video. You guys could look it up. I show this every once in a while. Uh, it's called Eight Reasons I Don't Share My Faith. Real cheesy. It was made probably 20-some years ago uh, by some Christians. I don't even know who they are. Uh, but it's very humorous, and, but it resonates. It's eight reasons that you d- typically people are afraid, and, and they're exaggerated. And so he's telling his friend why he doesn't, and then they switch to like a little skit where he's living it out, like, I'm afraid I'm going to get made fun of, and then they have all these people making fun of him. Uh, And so eight different reasons like that, but I think each rings true. That's why it's so humorous. Uh, Something in us, yeah, I am afraid I won't have the answer. I'm afraid, you know, I I won't know how to start the conversation. I'm afraid of this or that. And so uh, it ends with, these are more excuses than reasons not to. And uh, I think a really big one is realizing what's at stake. That's why we're kind of talking about this on this day, uh, the topic of hell, is a lot of times we share, I think, the gospel and what we believe with people from the context of this life. And so we think, um, yeah, if they say yes or no, there's a lot of people that are seemingly okay in this world without Jesus. Um, and, and so we don't take it as seriously. But when we realize what's really on the line, it should really drive us. There's a lot more to their decision to receive or reject Jesus than this life alone. And so I think it's healthy for us to look at this topic of the afterlife. And we've been talking about it a lot lately, so it's good to kind of get into it. So with that, we're actually going to leave the youth. It's a shorter study. It'll only be about 30, 40 minutes. Uh, but we're actually going to y- leave the youth in here today because we thought, ah, oh, this is probably a good topic for everyone to listen to because it produces certain things which we'll look at in just a moment. So let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer as we get into it. So, Father, we thank you for your goodness today. We thank you for your word. And, Lord, we do just commit our time to you now. And, Lord, I look around, I even see a few people that aren't here. I just pray that you touch them wherever they're at, minister to them, uh, whether it be physical, emotional, or just busy with other things, that you'd encourage and meet them today. Uh, For us right here online or Uh, in person, Lord, that you would meet us. We know you're here. We just pray that you would teach, that you would make these things clear, that you would give us understanding, 
And that this doctrine that you talk about a lot in your word, that we would reap the benefits of this doctrine, of why you share so much of it in your word, that it would produce certain things in us, one gratitude from what you, for what you saved us from, uh, also that would stir us to action, Lord, for those that are going there, to pray for them, to share with them, to, to reach out to them out of love. So I just pray that you would share right now out of your wisdom, that you'd put your words in my mouth, uh, and that you'd minister. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so you guys could turn. We're going to be at a lot of scriptures. My daughter's at the helm over here, so she's going to be showing a lot of the scriptures online here. We'll, we'll post them up here because we'll go at kind of a rapid pace sometimes with some of the verses. So you could read along or take notes. Um, but we've been talking about the last days for the last several weeks. Uh, so we've been in Matthew 24. We've covered a large section of 25 already. We'll finish that up next week. But part of that discussion of the end times is what's called the final state, and that is where we will spend eternity. Uh, heaven and hell is what the Bible refers to it as. We've seen several verses over the last few weeks uh, that have talked about this final judgment that's going to occur, the blessings of obedience and surrender to Christ, and the consequences of rebellion and rejection against him. A couple of the verses I'll just read to you here, but chapter 24, verse 51 it says, and I will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We looked at that a few weeks ago. Chapter 25, verse 30 says, and cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's the verse we ended with last week. And next week, we're going to look at two more. Verse 41 says, and I don't think 41's in here. But then he will also say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And then next week as well, we'll look at verse 46 of chapter 25. And it says, And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And that verse we're going to look at again in a little bit. bit. That's an important verse that we'll look at. These are only a few of the verses the Bible uses to describe what will happen after this life. Jesus and the New Testament authors, they reference this hell, this, the, the afterlife, the consequences, or what comes after this life, many times in the New Testament. So it's important that we understand what it says about it. It's serious, too, because there's a lot at stake. If the Bible's true then there's much more to our existence than this life on earth. And so we have to take that into consideration. We'll spend eternity, again, in one of two places, what the Bible calls heaven or what the Bible calls hell. This afternoon, we're going to look a little bit more on the doctrine of hell, of what the Bible talks about, says about hell. And we'll look a little bit, we'll end on a high note, we'll look at heaven in, con in contrast to hell and what the Lord accomplished on the cross in enabling us to go to heaven. And although that doctrine of hell is difficult to hear at times, even as Christians, as it should be, we'll look at that in a moment, it's valuable to understand. It produces certain things in our life. One of those things is it shows us how serious sin is. That The wages of sin is death. The ultimate consequences of sin is this place the Bible calls hell. Sin is committed so freely in our world today, it's kind of, we're kind of desensitized to it to a degree. It kind of becomes washed out. We take it for granted. It doesn't seem so bad, and it doesn't seem to warrant the type of punishment the Bible describes it will ultimately mete out. But we'll see in a little bit that God takes sin very seriously. And when we minimize sin, we marginalize and minimize what Jesus did on the cross. If it's not that bad, then why did the God of the universe have to endure what he endured to pay the price for it? Sin is a very heavy thing, and it's very serious. And so when we understand that, we understand the gravity of the punishment that's appropriate to the crime. As a result of this, for the believer, when we understand sin, how serious it is, and its consequences, it should make us thankful. That should be a one, one healthy product of studying hell is not only the 
seriousness of sin, but also our gratefulness, thankfulness to Christ for all that he's forgiven us of and rescued us from. It should also motivate us as Christians. Once we understand what hell is, we should be motivated to deliver those around us or be used by God to share the truth and the hope so that those around us that are headed there won't go there. Years ago, I read a book called 23 Minutes in Hell. It was a book that uh, Pastor, when I was over at Downey, Pastor Jeff had me do a book study, a book review on. Um, and so I read it and looked at it. And there's questions about it. You know, can someone go to hell? He, this guy said he literally was transported to hell by God and given a vision of hell and what it was going to be like. He experienced the agony, the pain, and everything. And he was there, he said, exactly 23 minutes. And so um, it was an interesting thought to, to think about. But what I did ultimately was every experience that he faced, he, he assigned a scripture to. He used a scripture to reference what he was experiencing. So I ultimately took his experience out, whether you believe he went there or not. If you just let the scriptures that he quoted paint the picture of hell, it did something very healthy in my life. It did these things. It, it caused me to be very grateful for what Christ had delivered me from. But also I found myself, man, I got to get as many people from going there as possible. It stirred me to want to share the gospel more. And that's why hell sometimes is important to talk about for even a believer, not just unbelievers. For those that don't know, know the Lord, the verses that we're going to look at, the ones we just saw, they should be scary. Those should be scary verses, very sobering verses that make us contemplate it. Is I got to make sure this stuff isn't true, right? I got to make real sure the Bible is not true if I'm not surrendering to it because the consequences to not believing it are very serious. And so um, hell, again, at times could be hard topic, a hard topic for believers to talk about because on the surface, hell seems to be difficult to reconcile with a loving, merciful God that many of us have come to know. And so when we look at the severity of some of these verses, it could be like, ooh, boy, that's, a, that's, that's rough to hear and to talk about. It seems out of character for the God that has saved me and loved me and been so good to me for these so many years. So this morning, we're going to take a little bit of time. This afternoon, I'm sorry, this isn't the morning. That's why we got to get back to Sunday mornings. Watch. We're going to get back to Sunday mornings, and I'm going to be say this afternoon, we're going to talk about. Uh, but this afternoon, we're going to look at a, some scriptures that let the Bible describe what hell is. And then we're also going to look at a few of the objections and reconcile these thoughts about uh, how can a loving God um, put somebody in hell for eternity. So we start here with some of the names used or interpreted hell in Scripture. There's a few different words the Bible uses uh, to talk about the place where people go after they die. Two of the words are a temporary holding place for the unbeliever. That is, in the Old Testament, it's Sheol. In the New Testament, it's Hades. And those are the two of the references that are that's to the temporary holding place for the unbeliever. Another word that the New Testament uses for a final destination is, for those that reject God, is called Gehenna. That also is translated hell, the lake of fire. And we read it's also called the second death, which is an important term that we'll look at here in, in a moment, what that means as far as the second death. So in Revelation chapter 20, I think you got that there, Rachel. Revelation 20, starting in verse 11, there's a few slides here. But uh, this is towards the end of the book of Revelation, and it says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it. Now, the great, there's different judgment seats. There's the Bema seat judgment for believers where we get rewards, and there's a great white throne judgment. And so the great white throne judgment and he who sat on it, and from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Now when we stand on our works, we see what happens in verse 14. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, 
This is Gehenna. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And so that's, those are a serious portion of verses there. And this is where the ultimate judgment after the millennial reign, um, the dead are in Christ, that have, those, the dead who had not placed their faith in Christ, their bodies are resurrected, uh, and they are judged based on their works and the rejection of Christ, and they're cast into the lake of fire forever. The idea of the second death, that's an important term, because some people will hear that and say, well, see, we die. There's an ultimate destruction, and so we just cease to exist at the second death. But that's not understanding what death means in Scripture. We've already seen some of the verses that we opened up with earlier. Those who suffer in the lake of fire in Hades seem to do so consciously. They're weeping and gnashing their teeth. And so you can't do that if you're unconscious or you cease to exist or you're annihilated. And so there's a conscious element to the torment that those endure who fail to receive Christ as their Savior. It's important, again, to understand life and death in Scripture is not talking primarily about existence. It's talking about proximity, proximity to God. So life in Scripture is speaking about those that have been forgiven and restored to a relationship with God. They're given access and fellowship with him. So eternal life are those who have eternal access and closeness to God forever. And so that's what eternal life is. Death in Scripture is separation, right? So eternal death is eternal separation. We take the example of physical life. When you physically die, when someone physically dies... They don't cease to exist. There's a separation that occurs. Their soul, their spirit, who they are, comes away from their physical body. That's what we call physical death. Their body lays lifeless there, but who they are has been taken away from their body, and they go elsewhere. And so the idea then of a second death or a second separation is a spiritual one, and that is when our spirit is absolutely separated from the presence of God for either for eternity for the second death or that second separation. And that's what that's talking about there. This idea of this separation in relationship to hell is talked about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. We have that on the screen here. It says, These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And so hell is about being completely absent from the presence of the Lord. And this helps us understand, this helps explain why hell is the way that it is. Hell is a place where God's presence is completely absent. So all the things that describe who God are is, who God, who God are, who God is, God is light, God is love, God is goodness. Many things that we experience in this life uh, even by those that don't know the Lord, are still benefits of the Creator. And so there's people on this earth, we just still don't know what it's like to be absolutely absent from the presence of the Lord, because we have the benefits of light, sunshine, and air to breathe. And because God is relational, He's created us to have relationship and enabled us to have relationships with other people. So we still, even if we reject God, even if we don't trust in him on this earth, we still benefit, benefit from the goodness of his presence here on earth and the way he created things. Hell seems to be a place where all those things are completely absent. So there's no light, no love, no joy, no peace, no hope, um, no relationships. It seems to be a dark, lonely, despairing, painful place. And so that's what the Bible describes hell as being. So we see verses, for example, like Matthew 25, 30. It says that, And cast that unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so because God is not there, there's no light, and it's a place of moral and it seems even physical darkness. Jude 1, 13 also says, um, Raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So and it's not just darkness, but extreme, utter darkness. And so um, darkness, have you guys ever been in a place where there is no light at all? It's almost suffocating. 
Uh, you're, om- you're overwhelmed. It almost feels physical when there is no presence of light at all. And it's a very disarming thing. Yeah? You, you almost start to panic and <gasps> feel like you're suffocating. And so imagine that utter, complete darkness, no light at all. It's kind of the description of hell. Also, because God is not there, there's no peace and joy. And so we get this description of hell that is a place of torment and flames. Luke 16, I think we're all familiar with, is the story that Jesus tells of Lazarus and the rich man. Now, there's a lot of scriptures that describe hell, but this is probably the most graphic and descriptive story that we have as a whole of what hell is like. And so you could read that later on, uh, Lazarus and the rich man, but here's a few verses, 23 and 24. It says, this is Lazarus speaking, saying, and being in torment, in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, saw Abraham from afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. So this is the rich man, I'm sorry. Then he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And so interesting concept here, this idea of torment and flames. And so I'm going to read actually uh, related to this torment. Norman Geisler in his Uh, book, uh, Systematic Theology on Hell. He had a a couple good quotes on this idea of torment and flames. Um, Here he says, it's noteworthy that scripture nowhere describes hell as a torture chamber where people are forced against their will to undergo agonizing pain. This is a caricature of hell created by unbelievers in an attempt to paint God as cruel. That a loving God will not torture anyone does not mean hell is not a place of torment. There's a difference between torment and torture. Jesus said it is. However, unlike torture, which is inflicted from without against one's will, torment is self-inflicted by one's own will. As has been noted even by atheists Jean-Paul Sartre, the, the door of hell is locked from the inside. He goes on to say, we can be condemned by our own freedom. Torment is living with the consequences of our own bad choices. Torment is the anguish that results from realizing we used our freedom for evil and chose wrongly. Everyone in hell will know that the pain he or she is suffering is self-induced, hence the weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so it's really an agonizing, a torment, and it even kind of gives a description that people may continue to sin. Whatever's going on in hell, um, they may continue to perpetuate this behavior of rebellion against God. As far as the flames, hell is also depicted as a place of eternal fire. The fire is real, but not necessarily physical. This is what Norman Geisler says here, at least not in the customary understanding that we have of it, because people in hell will have imperishable physical bodies, so normal normal fire, fire will not affect them. Further, the figures of speech that describe hell are contradictory in some places in the physical sense. Hell has flames, yet it's darkness. It's a dump, yet it's a bottomless pit. While everything in the Bible is literally true, not everything is true literally. And so, again, these figures of speech, whatever this fire is that the Bible talks about, a lot of these are figures of speech to help us somewhat comprehend what it will be like. And so whatever it is, it's agonizing. And and it will agonize us even in our resurrected or in eternal bodies. And so um, that's, again, a little bit about these ideas of torment in hell. So there's many other verses to look at, but I think these kind of give us somewhat of a good picture of what hell is like. Uh, A little bit, too, again, just about some of the descriptors of hell. The nature of hell is a horrifying reality. Hell is like being left outside in the dark forever. Hell is like a wandering star, a waterless cloud, a perpetually burning dump, a bottomless pit, an everlasting prison, Hell is a place of anguish and regret. And so again, kind of putting together all the descriptors of what hell is like, that paints a very graphic picture that should be very sobering and fearful. And again, the consequences that God says are that of sin. But perhaps the worst aspect of hell is its duration. 
is the fact that it's eternal, that it will never end, and it kills all hope of change. I think that's the greatest thing that we'll look at in just a moment. But we go to, to chapter Matthew 25, 46, and we see this eternal aspect of hell. And it says, too, about this great judgment, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. A lot of people get hung up with the word everlasting or eternal in Scripture. Many will try and explain it away and say it doesn't mean an endless period of time. Even though there's other scriptures that do talk about how it goes on forever and ever and uses different words. But really the context dictates how to interpret the word if it does mean forever or a period of time. And here it's clear it means forever. The same word here that's translated eternal punishment, ever, that word everlasting, that word there, everlasting punishment, that's the same word for eternal in that same verse, eternal life. And so whatever heaven is like, the duration of heaven, it's the duration of hell. So if heaven is a temporary blessing and then we cease to exist, then that's what hell is too. But I don't think too many people believe that. It seems very clear that we go on living forever from the rest of Scripture. And so heaven is eternal. And that same word to talk about the duration of heaven is used to talk about the duration of the punishment for those that reject Christ. So the idea there of eternity, never ending, no hope. Just think about that. When you have a bad season in your life, what gets you through it? The hope that it'll get better right? When, when you don't think it's going to change and hopelessness sets in, it's gut-wrenching. And just look at this last year, 2020. It, people were depressed, in despair. Many people were committing suicide. Just because, and, that, and 2020 has nothing on hell. But, but the, what got people through 2020? 2021, right? You heard that at the new year, 2020, and for some reason they thought at midnight everything was going to change. 2021, it's going to be a new year. It's the same, right? Nothing really changed on January 1st, um, but, but what carried people through, especially those that don't know the Lord, the hope of change. When that is taken away, that is gut-wrenching. Even for the Christian in this life, we have hope in a better life, so we are, we are equipped in a sense of even if the rest of my life is in despair and agonizing and painful, it's okay because there's a better life after this one, and that one's eternal. That keeps me going. It keeps me from utter despair. When that is taken away, it is crushing emotionally in every way. And so the idea of those people in hell for a day saying, I could do it, I could do it because tomorrow it's going away, that tomorrow will never come, ever and ever, for billions and billions of years, they'll, they'll be stuck in that state of utter darkness, loneliness, and despair. That's, that, should, that should horrify us, right? That should strike us, even as believers, that anybody would have to endure a fate like that. So the Bible, again, seems to talk about hell as a place of conscious, eternal torment, right? So have a good Sunday. <laughs> Why do we talk about that? Why would we talk about that on a Sunday morning? What a downer that is. Well, mainly because the Bible talks a lot about it. And so if we're going to, we just scratch the surface really on the verses that we've covered here. There's many more verses that talk about it. So if we're going to study the Bible to any depth, if we're going to go through it verse by verse, we're going to have to deal with sin or with hell periodically from time to time. And so we've kind of gone over a few of those verses, so this is a good time to stop and say, let's kind of put many of them together, and it's good again for us to get the picture that God paints through his word collectively about what hell is like. And again, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's several benefits, and we'll look more about that in a moment. But first, let's address maybe some hesitation, some concerns, some reconciliation that we might have with those that know the Lord and this topic of hell. Those that know God as a loving, merciful, kind God, but now, man, this place seems really bad. You know, the God I know, would he send people to this place? For this reason, some Christians, a minority, a few of them, had developed a doctrine called annihilationism within Christianity. And annihilationism is really the idea that we cease to exist after we die, or that 
we live a short period of time after death, we exist, and we endure a short period of suffering, but then we cease to exist after that period of time. And although that might sound appealing at first, um, based on the scriptures we've just read, the Bible contradicts that understanding. And so that doesn't seem to be what the Bible teaches about hell. Although I, I agree with some of those guys on other issues, I respect some of them, um, I disagree, and I think the Bible does as well, on that issue of what hell is. So how do we reconcile hell with God's love? And it's actually pretty easy when we look at the nature of God. It's true, God is loving, God is gracious, God is merciful, but he is also just as holy, righteous, and just as he is those things. All his, of his attributes are equal. And so God is absolutely holy and righteous. Sin has to be dealt with. Rebellion and sin have to be paid out. Even us, in our own understanding, get that. It's not fair and equitable to get, let somebody who committed a crime just go scot-free, right? How would you feel in a courtroom if someone murdered someone you cared about and the ju- judge said, you know, I'm a loving judge, so just go ahead and walk out of here? You would say, that's unjust, that's unrighteous. And so even within us, it's programmed this understanding that Justice has to be paid out, and God, being absolutely just, has to deal with sin. We should appreciate how he dealt with it, and we will in just a moment. Again, we get back to that idea, the problem is we don't think sin is that bad. That's the real problem. That's why we have a problem with hell, because we don't think sin is that bad and deserving of the punishment that Scripture talks about. As I mentioned before, there's so much sin in our world that we've become accustomed to it. It doesn't seem so bad. It's just a little white lie. Come on, everybody does it. It's just a little bit of pride, a little bit of lust. And the world today has made the things that are opposed to God seem so natural and loving and tolerant. They've kind of switched the script, and the things that God says, these are wrong. The way that he's created things to be, the world today says, no, those are good things. They're not bad. And many people are going like, yeah, what's so wrong with them? It's because we've had our understanding changed to differ from what God says is right and wrong. Yet every single sin, the Bible says, is an offense against an eternal God. God is eternal, and he's made us in our image, in his image, I should say, and so we live forever as well. You put that together with God's holiness, God cannot be around sin. And so our sin, therefore, eternally separates us from a holy and righteous God. And so that's the consequences of our behavior. I, use, I like to use the analogy of a neutron star. Right? What does that have to do with sin? Neutron, a neutron star To our understanding, that's the heaviest substance in the known universe. Maybe there's something more, but as far as scientists know, that's the heaviest substance in the known universe. A teaspoon, get this, a teaspoon of matter from a neutron star is one billion tons. Think how dense that is. So that's how dense it's compact. You know how heavy that is? They estimate that's the weight of Mount Everest. Mount Everest weighs a billion tons. So take Mount Everest and press it so much down to a teaspoon, that's how dense a neutron star is, right? So that's the heaviest substance in the known universe. And each sin is like a teaspoon of a neutron star spiritually, right? It is so heavy, it pins me. Picture that being tied to your ankle, and it drags you and and pins you to the pit of hell, and to your ability, it's absolutely immovable. Then you multiply that. How many sins have you committed, right? We've committed multiple thousands, if not millions, by the end of our lives. Can you imagine the ball of neutron star that's attached to each of us on the day of our death, and it pins us to the pit of hell? See, we don't think sin's that bad. We think, oh no, it's a spoonful of sugar right? It's not that bad, right? It tastes good, right? And so it's light and fluffy. Uh, But God says, no, it's disgusting, intense, and dense, and it's attached to you, and it drags you to the pit of hell when you commit it. And so the problem, again, is our understanding of the nature of sin. But think about that now for a moment. Think about what Christ then did on the cross. He took my big, immovable, neutron star pile of sin 
You multiply that by the billions of people who have ever lived, and all that weight was put on Jesus on the cross. That's what he endured on the cross. That should make us worship Jesus, right? For his glory, for his love, for his grace, the power that was displayed on the cross, the holiness of his character, that he would be able to pay that penalty on our behalf. It's one sin's immovable to us, let alone a lifetime, and then every person who's ever lived, all put together, and the penalty, the weight of it, was put on the shoulders of Jesus on the cross. Hell shouldn't offend us. It should make us worship God more. It should make us thankful for his glory and the power of the cross. Now we will end with heaven as a contrast, because that's a great transition of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. As, he- as horrible as hell is, that's how glorious heaven is. They're the exact opposite of one another. Heaven's a place of joy, of peace, of light, of hope. No more pain, no more suffering. Everything that's described about hell, heaven is the absolute opposite. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 tells us why. Because it's about the proximity of Jesus Christ. Jesus is perfect and glorious and beautiful. It says, "Then Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And that's why heaven is so beautiful. He's light, he's love, he's glory and peace. And so to be in his direct presence for eternity. Think of the pendulum swing there. One moment, I have a immovable ball of sin attached to me that the day I die will drag my spirit to the pit of hell forever. Right now it hinders and, and interferes with me fellowshipping with God. When I receive Jesus Christ, the consequences are put upon the cross. I'm set free to the degree that the Holy Spirit lives in me. I have immediate communion with God, and then I go to a place for eternity of glory, of bliss, and beauty. Wow, talk about what Jesus did on the cross, right? We just look look at it many times in the natural realm, and, oh, I feel better, and, oh, it's going to help me in life more, and and I appreciate the forgiveness, so it, it makes me emotionally feel better. Man, so much more happened than all that. All that's true, all that's great, but so much more transpired when we received Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And so, um, if you don't know the Lord, if you're watching or you're here, you backslide, I don't know, I know most of you guys, but um, it's a good thing to know, if you don't know the Lord, what are you waiting for? Not only are there eternal consequences, but even in this life. This life's hard. This life's a hard thing to go through. Now, when you receive Jesus, you're still going to go through hard things. You're still going to be hurt by people. You're still going to go through difficult circumstances. You're going to still experience grief and loss in life. But why not go it? Go through it with a God who is loving and merciful and cares so much for you that he died for you. And so um, why go through it alone? And then... Think of eternity. Why go to, it almost seems like a no-brainer. Do you want to go to this place we just described or to a glorious, beautiful place that we, is indescribable, right? And so that's, that in itself seems like a no-brainer. Even if I got no benefits from now until the day I die, just to receive that would outweigh anything I would endure in this life. And so the afterlife should be motivation in itself, But I realize there's much more even in this life when I receive Jesus Christ. And if we do know the Lord, what should this do? Man, it should make us thankful. It should make us have a heart of worship and appreciation to God. And it should stir us. Man, there's a lot of people. There are more people than not that are going to heaven, right? So there's more people going to hell. I got stuck there. There's more people going to hell in our world today then there are going to heaven. That should stir us. That should frighten us to a degree. That should move us to, man, Lord, I want to be used to share with more people. I don't want people, anybody, going to this place the Bible talks about. And I'll end with this quote here from Wayne Grudem. It says, The reason it is hard for us to think of the doctrine of hell is because God has put in our hearts a portion of his own love for people created in his image. Even if his even his love for sinners who rebel against him. 
As long as we are in this life and as long as we see and think about others who need to hear the gospel and trust in Christ for salvation, it should cause us great distress and agony of spirit to think about eternal punishment. Yet we must also realize that whatever God in his wisdom has ordained and taught in scripture is right. Therefore, we must be careful that we do not hate this doctrine or rebel against it, but rather we should seek insofar as we are able to come to the point where we acknowledge that eternal punishment is good and right because in God there is no unrighteousness at all. And so again, we could talk about the nature of it, and there's a lot more questions that might, you might come up with. Why doesn't God redeem people? Why does he create them if he knows they're going to go to hell? There's answers to all those questions, but know that God is righteous, and he doesn't do anything unrighteous. So even hell is a righteous thing. And so that should stir us, again, to take the most opportunity to thank God and ask to be used by him to reach as many as we can before it's too late. Amen? So, Lord, we do come to you now, and uh, we thank you for your goodness. And, Lord, for those that do not know you, Lord, we first want to just give them that opportunity. Lord, right now, if somebody doesn't know you, then the concept, the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is separation from you. And, Lord, we have that analogy of that neutron star, Lord, that big ball that is tied to our spirit, and as soon as our spirit leaves our body, it just sinks. It drags it down to the depths of hell. And so, Lord, I don't want anybody to experience that. And, Lord, you offer that. You did not have to, but you loved us so much, you came, you went to the cross, and, and you took all the consequences of all that sin, and you bore it on your shoulders. The Bible says if we confess you as Lord and believe in our heart that you were raised from the dead to prove your sacrifice, we will be saved. That ball of sin will be cut from our ankle. We'll be free to fellowship with you. All hindrances to fellowship will be removed, and you'll fill us with your spirit. So I pray anyone in here who wants that, anyone watching uh, on the Facebook, that they would just ask that. It's simple. Acknowledge we're sinners. We have rebelled against you. We ask you to forgive us. We thank you for taking the punishment, the penalty in our place. Ask for forgiveness and to be filled with your Holy Spirit, Lord. So just be with them right now. And for those of us, Lord, that have received you as Lord and Savior, that, Lord, we would be so, it would just stir thankfulness. Worship, God, for what you've done, as well as an urgency, an awareness. We can't, we can't lead anybody to you, Lord. None can come unless the Father who sent draws them. And, but, Lord, I know that you're drawing a lot more people probably than we're sharing with. And so, Lord, make us sensitive, make us alert, and make us aware of the people you're drawing and how you want to use us. And maybe you want to use us in the drawing process just to make them think and consider and be a witness. Uh, and so, Lord, use us to the degree you want. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, why don't we go ahead and stand? And then we're going to uh, sing a song, worship the Lord. We should worship him more intensely after hearing that, right? He said, as sure as Jesus is mine. This is my story, this is my song, raising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, raising my Savior. Perfect in life. 
visions of rapture now burst at my side. Angels descending, bring from above echoes of mercy and whispers of love. This is my soul. Bless you guys. Have an awesome Sunday. See you again. God bless you.